Hello everyone and welcome to another Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. I'm Will Schick, Director of Product Development, and today we're going to be painting the one and only Han Solo from the Real Quiet Like Squad Pack for Star Wars Shatterpoint. Uh, that's all I got for this intro, so let's just dive in and get painting. Although, Anne, uh, your little screeny went down, so... You can either shout out the questions or you can give me my screen back. One of the two, whatever you'd like. I appreciate that. It's fantastic. All right, we're gonna start on his pants because I'm a firm believer that you put the pants on first. That's right. It's pants first, then socks. Kind of what kind of strange person puts their socks on first and then goes to their pants? That's just weird. That's just strange, Matt. Stop being weird. Oh, I bet you are. I bet you're totally a socks first, pants second person. I can see it. Oh, shoes first and then pants? That's just a disaster waiting to happen. Having been in a rush a couple of times and, and feeling like I could get, you know, like pants on over shoes, it never worked out. Everyone talks about slipping on a banana peel as peak comedy. I'm pretty sure it's putting pants on over shoes that's peak comedy. I don't know. I'll probably go back and forth, honestly. Han, 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 who knows? Which way do you think is correct? That's what I'm curious about. Pours milk in a bowl before the cereal. That's nonsense, because then you can't maximize your cereal usage. I know. You got to put the cereal in first, then you pour in the milk, because the milk is just there to add a little bit of liquid. It's not there to overtake anything else. Yeah, cereal isn't a garnish, it's the meal. Exactly. Anyone who tells you different is a liar. That's that's why you gotta that's why you gotta one hundred percent. One hundred percent. You gotta get in there and do the cereal first, maximize your cereal usage, and then you pour in whatever amount of milk can possibly fit after you've got enough cereal. Plus you do too much milk, then all of a sudden like your cereal's getting like soggy too soon and nobody wants soggy cereal. Maybe Josh. Maybe our art director Josh actually wants soggy cereal. He likes soggy. Did you know Josh likes soggy waffles? That's I know. Interesting. You know, I don't mind a half sog cereal, but like there are phases to the experience. Depends on the cereal, honestly. Like some cereals are better soggy. Most cereals are better, like softer, but you know, not soggy. Like I love a. Um... Mm. Uh, but I don't like like a soggy kicks or cocoa puff scenario. I like a I like a, an oatmeal raisin bran if there's no bran in it and it's just the raisins. <laughs> yeah. They should. Just the just the sugar raisins be the best. Like fr are frosting flakes just gonna do oops all flakes? <laughs> oops all frosting. Ugh. Hard pass on that. That sounds terrible. The other one that requires a slight bit of sog is uh, what's that one that's like uh, a slight bit of sog? Wheat. <laughs> Mini wheats? Sure. Because well, yeah. If, if you try to go in on those before they're slightly sog, your jaw hurts. Mm. A slight bit of sog is definitely the name of your memoir, by the way. I'm sorry that I brought that terminology into everybody else's life, but... That's right. I chose this life. The sog type life didn't choose me. I chose it. I... Yeah. I'm going to let you get back to me. 
we're just we're just painting a slight bit of sog on this hand swallow here. Yeah. It's a Tuesday. It's a very silly day here in the office. You said I couldn't be silly. Yeah, that's a difference. <laughs> Also, I don't, honestly, I don't remember saying that you can't be silly, but I believe that I said it. So I don't know what that means. You said I hadn't earned my silly. No, I said you hadn't earned your praise. There's two, this is very different. This is oh, very I different. I wasn't talking about praise. I thought, okay, well, this is just a whole misunderstanding. Hmm. This is why you haven't earned it. Yeah. Got it. All right. Just knocking in these little browns. We gave Han the brown pants because this is this is episode six, Han. So he's not wearing the blue pants. He's wearing the brown pants. That's very important. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. There'll be a test later. Now, I do have a very real question for you. It is cereal related. Oh, well then it's not really real, is it? Uh, it's, yeah, I get it. That's very funny. Um, the question is, would blue milk enhance or hurt the cereal as food? Well, if we go off of if we go off of Andor, where we see uh, that one very upset um, security guard guy who wants to be good for the Empire, or whatever, and his mom, like they eat the cereal, but they eat it dry. So what it tells me is that blue milk is not good on cereal. No, he eats it dry the whole time. I know because it drove me nuts because he just eats like one ball of cereal at a time. It's just one ball of space cereal. At a time. Uh, so, Tactical Rock that he's morganing on is actually, it's the uh, droid from Jabba's Palace that runs like the uh, the droid center. You know, the little, he, he's the one who burns the droid's feet. Well, not him personally, but he oversees it. Um, I don't remember his designation, but that's, so that's the droid. So it's the, um, it's also in, uh, I believe it's the same droid that's in Book of Boba, same droid type anyway. So the, uh, I still can't remember his number, but effectively that's the droid um, that's under Han Solo's feet. So we like to think that, you know. It's the droid that we're looking for. As part of the, uh, no, no one's looking for this droid. Han Solo is getting some payback for his for his buddy C three PO on this droid. That's that's how I like to see it. And it's fair. It's a cool droid. Dallas might remember the droid the droid number that that Han's standing on, but I don't remember the type. I just know it's the droid from Jabba's palace that we see, um, and, and in Book of Boba, voiced by the one uh, Matt Berry. He's got to know this stuff. I know. But to be clear, I don't think the one that, that our Han Solo is standing on is uh, EV9D9, because he's obviously still around in Book of in Book of Boba. And then we're gonna grab some of this, and some of this. We're gonna make a nice little boot color. Boot, boot. Now we could have done the Han Solo blue pants and then he would have been from like episode four or five. But we did the brown pants. Because we've got that sick episode four Han in Stormtrooper armor coming. Think you made the fourth reveal. Get you know, all the Han Solos. Uh, did this version of Han have a coat as a concept at one point? You know, 
Um, I think very briefly, the pose concept did have his like, uh, his overcoat that he wears uh, on Endor, but we ditched that pretty quick, partially because um, we didn't want to specifically make this Han only Endor. So while well, he is kind of wearing his episode six get up, um, we wanted a bit more of an open interpretation of, you know, this Han is, you know, it's the general solo Han. So he could have been doing a lot of things either um, pre Endor after being unfroze, or he could have been doing probably more likely a lot of things post Endor as they kind of clean up the Empire and deal with Operation Cinder and all that other stuff that we learn about later after the movie as the New Republic is kind of getting formed up. You know, maybe this is the Han Solo that goes on the liberation of Kashyyyk with uh, Chewie. You know, it could be any of those things. Um, so we did, we did kind of make the conscious choice to make him a little less Endor specific and a little more generic Han Solo around the time period of Episode 6. And that allows players a bit more freedom and flexibility to um, construct their strike teams or create their own stories and their own narratives as they create their teams and all that stuff. And the other nice thing about not having the big trench coat is the trench coat obviously overwhelms quite a bit. It's very, very noticeable and you have to account for it in the posing and kind of the anatomy of the miniature and everything. And so by just having our Han Solo Sans trench coat, we get to see a lot more of Han Solo himself, which allows this pose to, I think, really shine in a way that it wouldn't if he was kind of swimming under the duster. Am I allowed to tell you on the This Is Some Rescue Box who's the primary, secondary support? I mean, I'm probably not allowed to, but I can. Because what's Ann going to do? Stop can. me? Can I? You'll allow it. See, now I don't want to just because you're like, I'll allow it. And I don't like that, but I'll do it anyway, just because. You just like to disagree with me particularly. For the well, clearly. Do you deserve this as a treat? Sure. To be able to tell people that? Or are you talking about chat? Does oh, chat no. deserve it? Because no. chat deserves everything. Chat they deserve the world. That's not the question. That's not a question. It's never mind. I think, I think everyone deserves this. Do I deserve it? Do I deserve the joy of getting to tell them? I I mean, honestly, we know the answer is no, but we also know that you can't stop me. Well, so that's true. You're on the mic. So. To be fair. And just uncontrollable in general. Um, so, the well, what do you think it is, chat? You tell me. Give me your best guess. And I'll tell you if you're right or not. Might as well have a little bit of fun with it. Who do you think the primary of This Is Some Rescue should be? Who was the person in charge of that entire operation? Do, do, do. Yeah, Leia. No, you nailed it. See, everyone knows. Leia was absolutely the primary character. Correct. Excellent work, chat. Uh, Luke Skywalker, daring, daring rescuer, I think, is his subtitle in this pack. I could be wrong about that. I don't have the card in front of me. He is indeed the secondary character. He does convince one Han Solo and Chewbacca to go along with the rescue, even though they completely botch it and Leia has to take charge immediately. And that, of course, leaves Han and Chewie as the supporting unit, as a combined two-character support. Um, that pack is easily one of my favorites that we've done so far as episode four is unequivocally my favorite of all of the Star Wars media. It's the one that totally got me into Star Wars in the first place, and it is the one that I can watch literally nonstop and never get bored. So it was very fun to work on um, and to get to go through and do all the cool quotes and everything else. So I'm very, very excited for people to see that pack and as much fun as we had with the uh, Luke and Vader packs that kicked off the OG trilogy doing the This Is Some Rescue pack. That was my favorite time in playtest, honestly. I just, I had so much fun. Oh no! 
Oh no, Chip, we're being observed. <laughs> I know. Fun, <laughs> fun police are here. All right, well, that's a thing you can say. Just, I did not know that Anne now has a mic back here. She does. You can have a mic now, too. You can just get right on there. Say hello to the people. Hi, people. It's Simone. What's up? <laughs> that's all I'm saying. That's, that's it. That's the end of it. We're done. Thank you and good night. <laughs> oh, well. Wow, we're see you, chat. The stream. I know usually I come to end the stream. But that's, good. that's true. You do. Simone is the alpha and the omega around here. The beginning and the end. El Simone says hello. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I told you. Tuesdays are a very silly day around here. A very silly day. Just go like a little brighter. Can I make this? Nope. All right, that's fine. It's a little dark, a little dark. Now this is pod racing pack. I mean, yeah, who knows? Who knows? I think this is pod racing be a little difficult because like is it really pod racing without the pods? The pod racers, if you will. I'm gonna quickly kind of blend these colors a little bit. This is a little mussy, but we can clean it up later. Just wanna kinda all I'm trying to really do is block in some of my shadows and highlights really rough really roughly so I can go back in later and refine all of the elements and stuff no I'm just talking to myself don't worry about it oh not were you talking to us no but I can hear you being like oh no he's talking to people he's not crazy maybe I am crazy I feel like you were though yeah, because you usually are. It's just how it works around here. The fans want Darth Jar Jar. I mean, sure, that makes sense. They kind of, you kind of got that though. I mean, with that crazy new Lego game that's supposedly coming soon that they showed off the preview for. That looks pretty fun. Infinite possibilities as you rebuild the Star Wars galaxy. Come on now. Shatterpoint and uh, Legion and X-Wing and all those other games, a little more grounded in the actual what really happened, the canonical aspects of, uh, of Star Wars compared to Lego. Get a bit more light on there. Okay, and then... Harrison Ford's hair. Show me his hair. Show me his hair. Yeah, it's kind of dark. Okay. You want me to pull up? No, I got it. I got okay. it. I just need to remember. I can't remember if he had like a dusty brown, which would have been a great name for like his compatriot, like Han Solo and Dusty Brown. You can hear the wah pedal when I say that. You can hear it. Could you imagine if that was Chewie's name? <laughs> Dusty Brown? And instead of, you get howdy. Like, just... <laughs> no, I think, you, I think you still get the Wookiee noise. It's just Dusty Brown. But they always have to use his full name. Not half his name, his full name. It's always Dusty Brown. Did you say Dusty Baby Brown? Dustbin. Oh, Dustbin Brown? That's just... Rude. Rude. He's just going to throw that shade on poor Dusty Brown and leave? All right, let's add this little bit of shade to the hair. And then we're going to grab some flash wash. Let's see how this goes. Oh, were there any challenges with making a hand feel like the strike team leader? So, I think the biggest thing was just balancing 
um, around kind of all the ideas that we had for him. One of the, his, his kind of key, his kind of key thing that he does is uh, keep a little optimism here. And I was really excited by the prospect of playing with the struggle tracker a bit more um, and what that could mean and kind of utilizing that quote. One of the things we like to do with Shatterpoint especially is use some of the more iconic quotes from each character to help define what we're trying to do rules wise. And so, you know, how do you keep a little bit of optimism in, in Shatterpoint? So playing with the idea of, you know, it manipulates the struggle tracker and gives you a bit of a leg up if things aren't going your way because Hansel is ever the uh, ultimate optimist. You know, he's, he's gonna keep, he's gonna keep fighting until he can't fight no more because that's what he does. Um, especially around this iteration of time and he's a bit of a gambler and stuff. So that one, getting that ability to feel strong, but you know, not ubiquitous and, and impossible to deal with from your opponent's side and everything. Those are always challenging abilities to do. So that went through a couple of different iterations to kind of get the balance and the timing right. Um, and there was some unique timing stuff with like, when do you gain the momentum and how does that affect um, scoring and winning a struggle and things like that. But overall, um, Han himself came together. I felt pretty well. Like, he, he came together overall pretty easily, and we had a lot of fun internally utilizing him. He's got a really strong, you know, we really want him to have that really strong gunslinger identity, which he gets from both his identity and his combat trees. And so you'll find, I think, once you get him on the table and start playing games with him, that He's shooting things a lot, you know. He gets the blast um, quite a bit between, you know, out, outnumbered, not outgunned, and then the identity ability, and then normal action economy. Um, and of course he pairs nicely with Chewie, and he does work pretty well with the commandos and what they want to do. So getting him to feel like General Solo, I think, wasn't, wasn't particularly something that I felt like we struggled with too much. Um, but it was definitely one of those things where, you know, it's always important to try to get these characters to feel good and correct and like themselves and, and drilling in on what Han Solo as a character is with his growth over the course of the different films and stuff that obviously, um, made it so that we had to be very specific in what we were thinking about and what we were trying to emphasize and those natures. And that was also part of the blast about doing the, this is some rescue pack in a similar time frame because we were able to say, okay, well, you know, is this feeling that we have here, is that more indicative of the scoundrel Han Solo who's still just doing it for the money? Um, or is this more of the Han Solo, who's thrown his lot in with the rebellion and now believes wholeheartedly in you know the cause and um, in his friends and all of this stuff. So we had a good a good way to juxtapose the way the characters were coming out and what they were trying to accomplish and and their point in the story and in their character arcs as well. Um, and especially with the, you know, the original trilogy stuff, we had so many characters coming in different roles so quickly because those original trilogy, you know, episode four, five, and six are pretty focused on a small cast of characters. And we've talked before about why that narrow focus was part of the reason that we leaned into doing the Clone Wars first because it had a wider band of more fleshed out or known um, personalities compared to the original trilogies, which were really hyper-focused on their central cast um, because that's what Shatterpoint, you know, it's all about. It's about all these different faces going around with their allies and their supports and doing cool, fun adventure stuff. Um, 
So it was really interesting to kind of shift gears and go from the Clone Wars where we really hadn't touched a second a character twice in a row in close succession. And then all of a sudden, here we are doing original trilogy stuff and we've got three versions of Leia and two versions of Han and three versions of Luke and all these different things going on um, all at once where we're really touching the characters over and over again, but at very different points in their story and in very different, you know, segments of the game where you're going from a primary to a supporting to uh, a secondary and, and all these different roles and how does that impact, you know, who the character is. And it was really interesting. It was a good stress test of the concept and the idea that we had originally that we could do all of these different versions of these characters and make them feel unique and useful and interesting. And then also make sure that we had enough, you know, other things within the era or around the era to be able to balance that stuff out um, and make it so that you could choose, you know, if you want to play Scoundrel Han and Chewie as a supporting unit. You're more than capable of doing that with the This Is Some Rescue, and you can, you know, support those out with, say, a uh, Luke Skywalker Jedi Knight, or, you know, um, a Leia, or some of the other things that are going to be coming as well. So it was, uh, it was a really kind of fun and interesting time. One that we'd always talked about, you talk about these things in concepts, right? We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. This is the thing that's gonna happen. And this is our plan and this is how we think it'll work. But then sometimes it takes a long time, potentially before you really get to dive into like the actual nuts and bolts of the thing that you talked about being how you wanna do it. Should have the ability to always shoot first. Well, it kind of does. Um, I mean, definitely that that version of Han, the Moss Cantina Han, um, 100%, probably needs a Django Fett not so fast kind of ability, right? Like, you have to account for the shoot first. Um, Although I'm always partial to the argument that like Han didn't shoot first, he just shot because there was no second shot. But yeah, we, we did try, you know, we did take a lot of pains and efforts with even General Solo here um, to give him that kind of shoot first gunslinger mentality and that's the outnumbered, not outgunned idea, and then the identity itself where he's taking shots as his allies, you know, take damage or get wounded. Um, really influenced by the scene where Leia gets hit in the shoulder by the blaster and then he snaps around and immediately takes out the assailant, um, capturing some of those moments from the film and everything to be in there. Crank up this vest a little bit. Add a little bit more color to this because we got a pretty dark gray, but we want this to be a bit more blue. Because we're doing we're doing animated styling here, so that means more color, not less. Kind of wash this over what we already did. And then we'll pick up some of that color and some of the shadows in there. It should quickly pull all this together for us.
And then, well, no, we got a whole new batch of Rebel characters. Part of one squad just went up. Because I was told at lunch today by our lead dev, Michael Plummer, that all of the uh, Kanan, Ezra, and Zeb squad cards went up today. So that's pretty cool. I know he's very excited by that whole segment of characters being a humongous Rebels fan himself. Just gonna really quickly knock in some little blue highlights here. You flexing your jaw over there? What's up? Sounded like, my jaw? Sounded like you were really like working your jaw there. Uh, no, I just had to, I was trying to quietly and unnoticeably uh, clear my throat. Mm. Um, but I've been, I've been noted. I didn't do you, it. You did get quietly, noted. So. You didn't, you failed. You failed the one Han Solo test. Sorry. That's all right. He wasn't real quiet like either. To be fair, he was very noisy. That darned tree branch, as it were. Uh, stronger characters might be more work to narrate, for sure. So the more a character can do, or the more you think of when you think of a character, right? You think of like a Darth Vader, um, you know, or maybe a Clone Wars era Yoda or something, you know, a character that is shown to be exceptionally powerful and kind of can do everything um, it absolutely makes it more challenging to dial in you know what what does the character need to be able to do uh, in order to feel good and correct and and those are those are where you really go back to the whole okay well where is this character in their journey um, what are we trying to really showcase with the character itself. Dialing in those kinds of questions helps you determine, well, what can we leave out? Or even discussing, you know, a little bit of like, well, we know that someday we think we might want to do X, Y, or Z with this character, and that ability would fit really well there, so we'll kind of hold off on that. We'll save, we'll put that one in the bank because we may come back to it a little bit later. Um, but it can be tough, and it's obviously always nerve-wracking to kind of go uh, into this stuff and know that you're dealing with characters that are very beloved and everyone has kind of their own vision of the character themselves and what they do and how they should function. Even when you say, well, you know, Chewie's going to be a supporting character. Um, or a secondary character, and that means that, you know, they're going to have abilities that kind of tie into that level of the game. There's always going to be that person out there who just loves Chewbacca and wants to see Chewbacca be the best Chewbacca they can be, and they're not going to analyze them necessarily with the idea that Chewbacca is X, Y, or Z within the context of the game. They're going to just analyze Chewbacca as, well, this is the Chewie that I think Chewie should be, and, you know, maybe we hit most of it, maybe we don't hit any of it, so everyone brings their own, you know, they bring their own kind of thoughts and feelings and analysis to the whole thing. Um, and that can absolutely make it a little bit more difficult. I feel like we have a brown ink, but maybe we don't, or a brown wash. But, you know, I haven't seen it, so that tells me that I'm probably completely wrong here, which means we'll have to make something up. Make something up. That's not it. Ah, this will work though, I think. I think if we use this mahogany. I'm pulling a little bit of maybe this color here. Make ourselves a nice little wash to tone down our browns. That seems okay. This, a little water. 
<laughs> yeah, the Thrawn, Thrawn was a, he was another really fun character to do. I actually had a lot of, had a lot of enjoyment doing Aiden as well. Um, just being able to dive back into Battlefront 2 and kind of really analyze like what that character should be able to do and, and think about it from a Shatterpoint perspective. Um, those packs are fun. Plus doing villains is always kind of enjoyable because uh, you get to unlock parts of yourself or your psyche or your personality that you normally have to keep bottled up. Like with Thrawn, you really get to get into that, you know, sinister, cunning, genius idea and how do you um, create a character that can punish mistakes and make life difficult for your opponent, but in ways that are fun and challenging and enjoyable for both players. And you always have to think that a game is played with two people, not just one. So even if you make something that is the most fun ever that somebody can have playing the game, if it makes the other person have the least fun ever, um, you know, it's not going to be successful because you need both players to want to come back to that game. So you have to try to make these abilities and these situations where players both have the opportunity to feel powerful but also to feel clever as they work around it. Why did we sign a Kallus instead of Rook? Um, that was mostly drawn because of the, the, the pairings that we were doing, right? So the Thrawn of that pack is absolutely drawn from his appearances in Rebels. We wanted that box to really stand as the counterpart to the Rebels squad um, and for the Rebels show. And so we went with Kallus because Kallus was a much bigger player in the overall narrative of Rebels. Um, and it also gave us the opportunity to kind of dial in and do some interesting things um, with how those packs interact with each other and the Kallus character himself. Uh, so that that's the my the major reason is that just thematically what we were trying to work on and create um, it made more sense to do the ISB agents and Callus because we were drawing directly from the animated show and not necessarily a you know we weren't doing Thrawn in a vacuum if that makes sense the the idea wasn't hey, let's put Thrawn as the character in. The idea was we're doing the Rebels characters. If we do the Rebels characters, we need Thrawn 100% to stand as kind of their big bad um, and to give players the opportunity and the options you know, to, to relive or to play out those iconic scenes or that iconic kind of... Uh, rivalry in Shatterpoint. So that that's the that's why Callus wound up in there because once we started analyzing, you know, the contents of the pack and kind of the purpose of those boxes and how they would fit together within the story of the game and you know what we wanted to present to players as options on the tabletop and everything, um, we needed, we definitely needed Callus, and we felt that having Callus in this point in his journey where he's kind of a man conflicted, you know, <clears throat> we talked I think a little bit about um, this mechanic becoming a, this newer mechanic that's going to come out first with Callus, and then you'll see later in the Lando pack well, um, but how do you show kind of these conflicting loyalties and how do you make that work in Shatterpoint in a way that feels fulfilling and gives players additional choices and shows these narrative progressions of these different people as they go along their, their own hero's journey or their own character arc. Um, and Callus made a lot of sense to do at that point because it gave us the opportunity to explore that idea but also do so in a way that built upon, you know, all of the, the releases coming out at the time between um, the crew of the ghost packs, 
and Thrawn and uh, everything else we wanted to do. So that was that was why we went there instead of you know um, instead of doing Thrawn's most probably well known or famous right hand man, depending on what if you've read any of the novels or any of that stuff, like how, how enamored you are with Thrawn backstory and history. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't see a Rook at some point, but it wasn't for, it wasn't meant to be for this pack. Well, I'm just happy to be here. It looks like you were missed. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, the quality of the painting definitely ex excelled while I was uh, <laughs> while I was away on my sabbatical, as it were. Okay. Let's see. What else do we want to do here? We want to. Go back in and kind of redefine some of these shadows. Whoop. This might be a hard question to answer. Oh, it might be. Um, but when looking at pairing the Real Quiet Lake squad with another squad for a strike team, what are some of your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the first and most obvious answer is is go with one of the Ewok packs, yeah. right? Like, um, obviously, the Rebel Commandos and and Han and Chewie, like, we're, they're drawing from that Episode Six idea, so they are they are designed and tested to make sure that they pair well thematically with their thematic counterparts. Um, so. That's the easy answer. And then if you want to do that, you know, largely my recommendation then is look at, you know, look at Leia as your other primary because she is the piece that unlocks so much of the synergy possibilities between Rebels and Ewoks. Um, and therefore she becomes really, really critical to a lot of those builds to get the most out of everything. Um, and the Commandos, the commandos play very well with kind of what the Ewoks want to do. They add some of the punch that the Ewoks are missing. Um, Han can really help with the Ewoks in their later game struggles, you know, with his uh, keep a little optimism here and everything like that. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of strong synergy possibilities with those, and you know, and narratively, it feels really nice. To kind of have them on the tabletop together. Um, it's you, the date night strike team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> A forest moonlit walk. <laughs> to remember. That's right. Um, so that's a that's a really easy, you know, kind of an easy quick pick that feels good. And um, we did we did do a lot of checking on and testing on. We wanted to make sure that that was a viable option. Uh, I think Han actually can pair really well with the Amidala squad pack as well. If you want to do some crazy player choice and maybe have the mother-in-law visit for a little bit. Um, but they both, you know, they both really excel at, uh, they have some pretty good ranged abilities. Um, you won't get as much out of the synergies, obviously, between all of them. But I do think that they can pair pretty well uh, and make some, they make for a fun. They make for a fun strike team. I don't know that they'll be like blowing the lid off of any kind of events or anything like that. But 
um, for fun, to try out. fun casual game night just at your store on your kitchen table. You can call um, that one the rehearsal dinner. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> rehearsal dinner. Um, so those ones work quite well. I think once you get beyond that, you know, you can really start to do some mixing and matching. Um, and it's kind of dealer's choice. You, you can pair Han with, you know, a pretty potent, like, um, you can, you can pair him with some good, like potent melee options. And then he can serve as kind of your, your back support, um, and deal with threats at range and kind of be the mobile threat while your heavy hitters pin him down. Um, if we want to keep going on the whole, like, we're getting married theme because like everyone at AMG is getting married in May. It's true. We already had one. We got we got another one on the way, and then one more. Like I think there's three. Is there three or four? Yeah, it's like three, and it's like all within yeah. two weeks of each other. It's kind of wild. Yeah, yeah. Because we just had we just had the one. We just had Ryan's, and then we've got Justice's, and then yours, right? Yep. Yeah. But let's not talk about it because the t time can't exist for me. All right, time doesn't exist. So anyway, focus on where we are presently, like we're all going soon. Uh, so keeping to keeping to the whole like let's talk about wedding party themes. Um, I think you can you can absolutely take you know Han, throw him in with Daddy Dearest with like a Jedi Hunter um, Vader, and um, like Inquisitors or whatever you feel like fits really well together. Um, for the Vader side, and you can see some success out of that really odd pairing too. Again, you're going to be sacrificing some of your cross synergies and everything, um, so it's really on your creativity and your understanding of how you want to run the squad, um, the squads and the strike teams to get the most out of it, but I, all of those things work. You know, Han can, he can slot in, I think, to a lot of places just based on what he wants to do and that's part of the fun about Shatterpoint is exploring those what ifs and seeing how, you know, some stuff could actually work. I'm just kind of going through and doing some like really quick black lining, dark lining. I shouldn't call it black lining because I'm not actually using black, although black is in the mix. Um, just to kind of punch up that Outrider contrast. Man, um... Uh, mouse droid variant of Gonkers. Oh, mouse droids be cheating though. Like, have you seen how fast <laughs> those things way. go? Yeah, the Gonks wouldn't stand a chance. Maybe, maybe we'll do a. Maybe we'll figure out a like a, a mouse droid pace car. How's that? You know, they always have they always have pace cars for when there's big accidents. We'll figure out a mouse a mouse droid pace car variant. And the mouse droid can like run out and do the pacing while they clean up the. They clean up the disaster, as it were. Or we do like a, a mouse droid, uh, find the intruders type vibe. Exactly, yeah. Oh, we They're could do always that. always finding intruders, those mouse I don't know. I don't know if anybody noticed this or not, but there is a, there is a mouse droid in that, in that squad pack that got, uh, that got unveiled on May the 4th. So... If you're a mouse droid fan, you might want to watch out for that because um, it's there. That's your opportunity. I'm doing this away from the camera, which is probably the worst way to do it. It's all right. All right. Well, I'm like pretty, pretty happy with this. I think we got to do a belt buckle. Well, it's not a buckle. Excuse me. They don't have buckles. A belt <laughs> medallion. I don't, closure? What do you? Well, it doesn't close anything because that would be a it buckle. It just—it's just part of the ensemble. I guess like it's a belt bracket because like it still holds on to two. Legs. It's a—it's a shiny. It's a shiny accoutrement. Um, assuming that I can find. There we go. This. Dallas, what if I said there were more mouse droids coming? 
I don't know if I could call you a liar, I guess, is the only answer that I'd have to that. Y'all are bold as brass today. I've got Schick on one hand wanting to talk about who the primaries and secondaries are. i got Dallas marching in. First of all, I was asked that question, and you said I could talk. That's true. But you also said that because you knew you couldn't stop me. So I was going to talk no matter what. Now it just seems like it's official. <laughs> like we're more under control because we've got all these fancy guests around. I think all these uh, folks, these fine folks in chat know that I have absolutely zero control. All the power? Me. You have all the power. I have all the power, but none of the ability to enforce anything. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Before we go live, that's when I, that's when I consider my power. But once we're here, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just over. It's just too late. Painters don't paint. Got to give him that Harrison Ford pout, that little. All right, and then, sure, that's real bright, but we'll just tone it down. I'm just gonna add a little bit of zing highlight on the buckle, not buckle. I don't. I'm gonna have to ask Simone what the heck to call it because it's not a buckle. There are no buckles in Star Wars. No buttons, no buckles, no zippers. Except when there are, because there are a couple instances. But apparently all the buttons were on Alderaan, so. I don't want this to go too, too bright, but I want to get a little zing in there. A little zing in there. A little zing in there. And then just do a little cleanup right here because I noticed it. And this is the part where you really start to get going back and forth as you try to fix all your little your little slops, your little mistakes. But honestly, this is the point where you can stop yourself anytime you want. I'm bad at it, but you can do it. So I'll clean up around a little. Separation between his shirt and his vest. Again, this is where dark lining is your biggest friend because the eye really wants to read those separation points. So doing a little bit of dark lining, even without any kind of crazy highlighting, shading or anything, will take your miniature so, so far. And it is one of those techniques that takes a little bit of time, patience, and perseverance to figure out because you are having to control, you know, the brush and the flow of paint, but the more you practice, the better you'll get, and the better you get, the better your miniatures will look at the end because they'll have these nice lines of separation and everything else going on with them, so. All right. And with that, we have a completed Han Solo. Uh, General Solo, all ready for battle. We just have to finish up the base and he'll be good to go for the tabletop. So all that within like 50 minutes, no problem. Oh yeah, uh, what does he have on his foot on top? It is the little droid from Jabba's Palace. Um, not the exact droid, but it is the EV-9D9 as Dallas came in and told us about. Um, that's the specific one. He's obviously still happy and healthy because he's in Book of Boba, helping out Boba do his stuff. So this is a different one, but regardless, he paid the price. All right, thank you so much for joining me. Hope you had a blast. Be sure to tune in tomorrow, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific. Dallas Kemp's going to be back. He's going to be working on some very cool stuff. I think he might have it done by now, uh, but he's working a couple weeks on a big show piece. That might be tomorrow. It might be like next week. I don't know. Um, but regardless, it's tomorrow. it is tomorrow. That's what I've been told. Uh, all right. But well, now he's committed. Now he's committed. 
So tune in tomorrow, 1 p.m. Pacific. Dallas Kemp is going to be showing off a converted uh, LAT LE uh, transport ship for Star Wars Legion. Uh, he's been working on this project for a couple weeks now. Uh, it's very, very cool. Um, he's going to talk about the process and paint it on stream and do some stuff there. So that should be a very fun one to tune into. Then otherwise, tune on back in next Tuesday and Wednesday next week. We'll be doing more painting, more hobbying, more hanging out. Till then, I've been Will. You've been great. We'll see you on the next one. Goodbye.